Hey there everyone, Mr. Lewis here ready to kick off our sixth and final unit here in AP Micro, Market Failure and the Role of Government. And what this unit is all about is analyzing the ways in which the government might respond through economic policy to some of the inefficiencies that are created in markets as we saw in units four and five. So this final unit only has six sections. We're actually going to take care of three of those sections today and then later in the week we'll cover the final two. So today we're going to take a look at socially efficient and inefficient market outcomes, externalities, and then public and private goods. And socially efficient and inefficient market outcomes you've actually really seen before. We're just using that as a segue into externalities. So first of all, 6.1, socially efficient and inefficient market outcomes. As you've learned in the past, there are socially optimal market outcomes, there are allocative efficient market outcomes, and then there are the opposite of that, socially uh, not optimal, <laughs> I should say not socially optimal or uh, allocatively inefficient. So social efficiency is achieved when a market generates the optimal quantity and price, the socially optimal output and the socially optimal price. And when this happens, the marginal private cost of the last unit is equal to the marginal private benefit of the last unit consumed. And, and that means we're in this nice, happy-go-lucky, socially efficient equilibrium and total economic surplus, meaning consumer surplus plus producer surplus is maximized. So all of these things are good, right? And we have supply equal to demand, marginal private cost equals marginal private benefit, and the marginal cost is equal to the price. So in a perfectly competitive market, all of these things are true. You can see here in the market itself, surplus is maximized. Here's consumer on top, producer on bottom, because we're at this market equilibrium quantity where supply meets demand, and marginal private cost is equal to marginal private benefit. And we even see this in the individual firm where even though they're maximizing profit, they're producing at the point where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. And marginal revenue in the case of a perfectly competitive firm is equal to price. So the marginal cost is equal to the marginal benefit or price in this scenario. So that's all well and good because in perfect competition, it is socially optimal, it is efficient, but what about inefficient market outcomes? We've seen that in perfectly uh, competitive markets, there is perfect competition and no firm has individual power. But in imperfectly competitive markets, monopolies, oligopolies, and monopolistic competition, some firms develop that market power and they use that market power to their advantages um, when uh, uh, maximizing profit. And so these firms tend to cause dead weight loss. And you can see that in this monopolistic graph on the right here, how the firm is producing where MR equals MC, but the price is above that marginal cost. And because they're not producing where our socially optimal output tells us uh, society wants to be, that creates this gap, this dead weight loss here, represented by this uh, red triangle. So what does the government do in response to this? This is when government economic policy comes in. They might attempt through various means to eliminate that dead weight loss. If the private market doesn't produce the socially optimal results, what society wants, then government policymakers might feel compelled to intervene and their goal would be to eliminate those market inefficiencies by designing policies that equate the marginal social benefit with the marginal social cost. So we're not just talking about private benefit and private costs, we're thinking about the society at large because that's what the government is supposed to be doing. And they have all kinds of tools that they can use to make this happen. So in a perfectly competitive market, we know that a, a few things are true at market equilibrium. The MPB is equal to MPC. We just saw that. Marginal revenue equals marginal cost. We just saw that. Price equals marginal cost. We just saw that. But the final thing is that marginal social benefit is equal to marginal social cost because in perfect competition, the private benefit is the social benefit. The private cost is the social cost. 
And if marginal private benefit equals marginal private cost, then ipso facto marginal social benefit must be equal to marginal social cost at that equilibrium. So what would cause these two things to not be equal to one another is the question. Well, one answer to that is imperfect competition. Monopolies, oligopolies, monopolistic competition, those types of marketplaces cause marginal social benefit and marginal social cost to not necessarily be equal. It creates dead weight loss, inefficiency. We also see though, and this is going to be our focus for section 6.2, that sometimes externalities exist. An externality is a side effect in a market. So this could even be in perfect competition. With an externality, there is some positive or negative side effect caused by the consumption or production or both of a particular product. So the side effects are experienced not just by the people in the market, the buyers and sellers in the market, but also by people who are not participating in the market, or in other words, society at large. So with a positive externality, the social benefit is greater than the private benefit. With a negative externality, the social cost is greater than the private cost. Society is experiencing some cost, not necessarily in terms of dollars, but a negative aspect, a negative side effect of this market, even though they're not participating in the market. This is affecting society, not just the private market itself. And the same thing is true with the positive externality, except there's some benefit that everyone's experiencing as opposed to just the benefits that are in the private market. It's experienced by society at large. So with a positive externality, society is going to want more of this good. With a negative externality, people want less. Some examples of a positive externality are things like education, healthcare. There are positive side effects associated with these things. So with education, the more education someone gets, they might be likely to, say, create jobs or cure diseases or whatever it might be. And that's going to help society at large, not just the people who are involved in getting that person's education paid for or produced or whatever. With healthcare, if people aren't sick, they can contribute to the economy and then everyone benefits. So that would be an example of positive externalities, where it's negative externalities are things like tobacco, alcohol, uh, fossil fuels. Okay, the production of fossil fuels causes carbon emissions, right? And so that leads to pollution, and that's a negative externality that everyone at large, society at large, is experiencing, not just people in the private market, not just producers and consumers of that uh, uh, oil or whatever it might be, but society at large. And those are just some common examples. So what about efficiency? How does this tie into everything? Externalities may create inefficient markets because if the market quantity is greater or less than the socially optimal quantity, what people are telling us they really actually want to exist in the market, or in other words, the allocative efficient output, then we may have some type of dead weight loss, right? If inefficiency is there, if the market quantity that actually exists is greater or less than the socially optimal quantity, then dead weight loss will exist. With a positive externality, the socially optimal quantity is greater than the market quantity. People want there to be more. With a negative externality, it's the opposite. People want there to be less. The socially optimal quantity is less than the market quantity. So what can we do about this? If a positive externality exists, then marginal social benefit is greater than marginal private benefit. The market demand curve is the same as the marginal private benefit curve. So remember, there's all these individual consumers along this demand curve who have their own marginal private benefit, or you can think of it as utility, that they experience when they consume this good. But if we have a positive externality, there is now a difference between the private benefit and the social benefit. Before, with no positive externality, the private benefit and the social benefit are the same. Because if it's not affecting anyone outside of the market, outside of this given market, 
then it's only affecting the private buyers, right? But if a positive externality exists, there's this added social benefit. So we have to draw in this new demand curve, if you want to think about it like that. It's society's demand. It's the marginal social benefit that is actually above the private benefit because society is experiencing greater good than just the private market. Now we have a new point where the social benefit intersects with the social cost. And that would be the socially optimal equilibrium. In the private market, the equilibrium is right here, where the price is PM and the output is QM. But this is showing us our socially optimal output, QSO, and our socially optimal price would be down here. Don't get tricked and go straight over from that equilibrium because in order for people to be able to buy more of this thing, the price would have to come down, right? So the demand curve here, our original market demand curve, is showing us in order for people to buy QSO, the price would have to be down here in the private market. So what can the government do to fix this deadweight loss? What can the government do to encourage more production? Our deadweight loss triangle, remember, points to the socially optimal equilibrium. It's pointing to the right. It's telling us we want there to be more. Society wants more. So what can we as a government do to encourage producers to sell more of a good at lower prices? That's kind of a tough sell, right? Well, we have a tool in our toolkit as the government that we can use. A per unit subsidy will help with this situation. And not just increase quantity, but actually, if it's effective, eliminate this dead weight loss altogether. So let's take a look. If this is our market, here's supply and demand, here's the equilibrium, there's the price, there's the quantity. If the government offers a subsidy, a per unit subsidy, per unit means marginal, right? Well, we have a marginal cost curve right here. And a subsidy would be decreasing that cost. They're giving money to these producers in this market. So the marginal private cost of production, MPC, is actually decreasing on the y-axis. It's costing less money to make this good because the government is helping out with it. So the new supply curve is going to be down here. And check out our new equilibrium. At this point, the quantity has now increased. The price has decreased. And it very much resembles where we said we wanted the market to be on the last slide. This deadweight loss has effectively been eliminated if the amount of the tax perfectly shifted this price downward to this much, to the socially optimal price. If that is exactly what happened and that appears to be the case in this market, we are exactly at the socially optimal quantity that we stated previously, that dead weight loss is now eliminated. So that's an effective per unit subsidy. What about negative externalities? In this case, you can see we already got an arrow here pointing to something. I bet you can predict what that is. So. If a negative externality exists, we have this social cost curve that's above the private cost curve. It's not about benefits anymore. It's cost because a negative externality means that the marginal social cost, what society is experiencing as a cost, a negative thing of some type, is greater than just the private market. So there's an added social cost. This supply curve, the social supply curve, so to speak, sits above the private supply curve. And so here's the socially optimal equilibrium. We want there to be less of this good and we want it to cost more for people to buy so that they don't buy as many. And so this triangular area here, don't make the mistake of just filling in this as dead weight loss because remember, our trick is that the dead weight loss points to the socially optimal quantity and it is pointing to the left in this case. So this is where our dead weight loss would exist. And uh, you can see we've labeled it as such. So what can the government do to fix this? If we know we want there to be 
less quantity in the market, less output, and we want the price to be higher to keep people from purchasing as much of this good because it's negative, it has a negative uh, externality, the government can charge a per unit tax. Here's what that would look like. Here's our original market, supply, demand, equilibrium. If the government imposes a per unit tax, per unit affects the marginal cost curve and tax means the cost is going up. They're making it more expensive to produce this good. So supply is going to shift upward or you can think of it as shifting to the left. Either way, it's costing more. So we should really consider it going upward. But either way, here's the new equilibrium. The quantity has decreased. There's QM2 and the price has increased. And so again, we have effectively erased this dead weight loss. This tax has fixed the inefficiency in the market. Now, is it always going to be exact? No, it's not. But if it is exact and the price moves up here and the quantity moves exactly where we said we wanted it to, then this tax has effectively solved the inefficiencies of this market. Finally, last couple things. Public and private goods. This is actually section 6.3. Private goods would be rival and non or excuse me, excludable, meaning there are competing firms in the market and you can keep certain people from using the good, say if they don't pay for it, right? If you don't pay for it, you don't get to enjoy the benefits of this product. But public goods are non-rival and non-excludable, meaning you can't keep anyone from using this thing. Okay, some consumers can enjoy the benefits of a public good without ever sacrificing any cost. This might be like making use of highways and bridges without ever paying any taxes, right? We call this the free rider problem. And the free rider problem means that there's a lack of incentive among private producers to produce some particular goods. Because if, if these firms know that there are free riders out there and they can't you know, force them to pay for this thing, then they might not want to produce that good anymore. There might be something more lucrative. And so they lose the incentive to produce these goods. So instead, the government might step in and decide to produce these private goods and instead allow free access to them. It's a way of taking the free rider problem and turning it into a social benefit, so to speak. So education would be an example of this situation. All right, that's it for these first three sections. There will be a checkpoint to go with sections one, two, and three of unit six tomorrow. But for today, that's where we will end. So thanks for tuning in and I will see you tomorrow.